ya. Oke. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Even as we are again wearing masks, as COVID um, is very active on our island, thank you so much to those of you who are um, wearing your masks today to help keep us all safe. And welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, at home. And those of you who are outside or downstairs wanting a little bit more social distance, we're so glad to be in fellowship and in community and in this body of Christ together. Welcome to this place. A few announcements today. I want to thank everyone who helped make our ice cream social, um, our ice cream bar happen at the rec center during our 4th of July celebration. Uh, there was a tiny little break in the rain for our sweet parade, and then we had a good time there at the rec center, so thanks everyone for helping to make that celebration happen. And just a reminder that next Sunday, we are um, continuing our long-standing tradition of honoring and celebrating Lake Superior Sunday. Here during worship, uh, the Marina Lechecki will be with me, and we will co-lead worship on Sunday, and the end of worship, we'll all go outside, as we always do, to Joni's Beach, and two things will be happening. We'll be baptizing the baby of Reva Palace and David Small, and I know, so exciting, and we'll be blessing and giving great thanks and saying prayers for Lake Superior, and then immediately following that, we're having a potluck barbecue right there at Joni's Beach, so I invite you to come next Sunday to bring something to put on the grill, some meat or some veggies and a side dish or a dessert. Um, we'll have folks that will be staffing the grills and we'll have charcoal there and we'll have paper products, but we, um, it's a potluck, so please bring all of the eats. And if you want to use our refrigerator during worship to hold on to your stuff, then that is totally fine. Um, I think we're good for setup and clean up. For that, uh, but I'm going to pass this around just so you can remember that you've signed up. <laughs> and if you see, and if you, um, we can always use more help with cleanup, so don't be shy. Also, I'm passing around our sign-up sheet for fellowship and ushers for our Sundays in July. And thanks so much to Deb and Kay who set up our fellowship today, which we'll have outside to help um, create a little bit more spaciousness, hopefully a little bit more safety. So thanks so much for that on-the-fly adaptation. We're so grateful. Also, I want to remind folks or point out to folks if you haven't seen it, as you go down the stairs, before you go out the doors, right on the right, you'll see an art installation that's called River of Hunger, River of Sustenance. And it's and it's a little, it's about three feet long, and there's a bed of wild rice. And on that wild rice are some beautiful ceramic spoons. And this was an art installation that was done a few weeks ago by an artist based in Minneapolis. And the idea is to help raise awareness and raise funds for hunger programs in various communities. And for us, the funds being raised will support our food shelf, 
which operates here at St. John's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the, the rice represents the river of sustenance, and the spoons represent hunger. And the idea is if you, they're beautiful spoons, so great for gifts or um, like little, uh, like if, you, if you're me and you like to cook and you like to cook Chinese food or Korean food, there's all kinds of little things to put on the dishes. So I love these spoons. So they're great, beautiful, handmade. And you can put a donation of any size in the jar that's right there and take as many spoons as you would like for yourself or to give away. And the idea is that as the spoons disappear, as hunger disappears, what we see is the sustenance that is enough as long as we share. So I invite you to um, notice that and read the material down there and take a spoon if you would like. Don has an announcement. Thank you, Don. Um, just a quick recap for those watching online who probably couldn't hear that. Thanks to Bill Green, who um, solicited and then sold the boat that's right outside. Um, and so the bazaar is already in the black, which is so great. And then also there's two Murphy beds that have been donated, and Don could use some help in um, either moving those or helping get those sold. So if you have some interest or if you, if you desire Murphy beds, talk to Don. And again, thanks so much, Don, for being our bizarre czar. We're so grateful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the last announcement I have is just um, to note that we, for now, have suspended congregational singing um, in recognition of the higher rate of COVID. So um, we'll be missing that, but look forward to having that come back around when it's safe for us to do that. Any other announcements? Gwen, do you have an announcement about the Island Closet? The closet will reopen, hopefully, a week from Monday. Yeah. Great, thanks so much, Gwen. Yes, Becky, oh, thank you. I had blood drive down here and I forgot to say something. Great. So blood donations happening on Wednesday at the school. We're in need of donors. If you are able to donate or to make sure and evangelize to all your friends and neighbors, um, thank you so much, Becky, for your work with that important ministry. Any other announcements? All right, I invite you to put down what you have in your hands. Put your feet on the floor. Feel yourself supported by the pew or the chair, or wherever you happen to be sitting. And simply breathe, knowing that there is nothing that needs to be fixed or changed 
or done right now. Simply to be present, to receive the love and grace and spirit of God that is here with you and in you and for you. Welcome to worship. I invite you to be in prayer with me and read these words adapted from a prayer written by Beverly Lanzetta. Most holy and divine presence, we are grateful to the bounty of the earth, the beauty of this day's awakening, the joy of being alive. God of abundance, God of possibility. In the hidden chambers of our hearts, we bow before your radiance and love, splendid, unearned. Grant us the humility and grace to receive such heavenly generosity. O oh, spirit of unfurling newness, may we grow ever closer to the awakening of your holy presence within us, within the world, within all beings. Amen. Good morning. The first reading is a reading from Jeremiah 6, verses 10 through 16. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? See, their ears are closed. They cannot listen. The word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. But I am full of the wrath of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. Pour it out on the children in the street and on the gatherings of young men as well. Both husband and wife shall be taken the elderly and those full of days. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have treated the wound of my people carelessly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. 
They acted shamefully, they committed abomination, yet they were not ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall, and at the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies and walk in it and find rest for your souls. The second reading is the reading of Matthew 4, verses 18 through 22. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called to them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts draw us closer to you, our strength, our redeemer. Amen. Last week, when I was introducing this sermon series that will be on for the next several weeks on spiritual practice, I said something like, the spiritual life is not about belief, but about practice. Afterwards, the next day, I ran into one of you, beloveds, who said to me, I, I heard you say that, Rachel, and I agree, but I was so surprised to hear from a Christian minister that the spiritual life is not about beliefs, particularly about beliefs about God and Jesus, because that's how I've known that Christianity is, is more about beliefs, where something like Buddhism or the Eastern religions are more about practices. And it's true. Christianity has for a long time now been associated with certain beliefs about who God is, about who Jesus is. And sometimes Christianity is even posed as something that you have to believe in order to be considered or to belong, in order to be considered Christian. And so I want to just say again, there has never been a time when all Christians believed the same thing. Never. One of my very favorite things about the Bible, in fact, and one of the reasons why the Bible is sacred text to me and, considered and continues to have such uh, authority for me in my life, is that the Bible refuses to allow us to say, look, this is what to believe. There are all kinds of beliefs about God and about Jesus that show up in the Bible, and they contradict each other. It's messy and beautiful and complex and engaging, and so I encourage you to join Bible study if you want to know more about that. It's not, of course, it's not that we don't have beliefs or they're not important, because of course we do and they are. But to paraphrase a saying that comes to us from our Buddhist siblings, our beliefs are just the finger pointing to the moon. They are not the moon. Meaning our thoughts and our ideas about God are not God. At best, at best, they help direct us and our hearts and our actions towards that mystery that we call God. At the end of the day, what we are aiming for is not to fill our minds with beliefs, but to fill our hearts with the mystery to fill our hearts and our lives and our world with God, to align our spirits with the spirit that is at the center of all things. Barbara Brown Taylor, 
in a great book called The Altar of the World, which talks about spiritual practice of living in the world. I really commend it to you. Barbara Brown Taylor says it this way, what we need in our lives and on our world is not more ideas about God, but we need more God. And spiritual practice is a way for us to help ourselves experience more God. Now, the emphasis on practice rather than belief is not just some new fangled, new age, watered down version of the faith, but comes directly to us from our ancestors in faith. These practices come to us from the desert mothers and fathers of the second and third century who fled Europe right at the time where Constantine was coming into power and making Christianity the state religion, and right at the time where councils were coming together to codify belief, these spiritual seekers, these lovers of Jesus, fled because they longed to embody and practice the presence of God rather than think about or describe God. These practices come to us from the Celtic Christian tradition, those Christians in Ireland from the 5th to the 11th century, who during that time were um, outside of the Roman Empire. And so they were allowed to develop their love of Jesus and their interpretation of the Jesus tradition in an embodied and earth-centered way, much more about practices. Again, it's not that there weren't beliefs, because of course they were, but those beliefs arose out of their practices, their experiences with the divine presence rather than the other way around. Does that make sense? Also, these practices come to us from scripture, as we heard from Julie's reading from the prophet Jeremiah. So at this point, the book of Jeremiah was written in the time of trauma, all before, during, and after the Babylonian exile, when, to put it mildly, the Hebrew people were at a crossroads. They were at a threshold. They, they had been coming out of a really graced time from the King Josiah. They had realigned, the Hebrew people had realigned with the covenant of God. They were living um, in uh, connection with God and love of God and love of neighbor. And then King Josiah died and they began to forget. And so they became less and less aligned. And um, the Babylonians were at their heels. They were about ready to lose everything. And Jeremiah, through the whole book, in lots of very sort of um, lamenting prose, as you, heard, as you heard Julie read, was begging the people to stop and pay attention and look at where they were, to learn from their past and make some new choices. It was a tumultuous and terrible time in their collective existence when all they had known was crashing down around them. And at this time, the prophet did not implore them to remember or recite ancient beliefs, but to look and remember and walk the ancient path. Thus says the Lord, says Jeremiah, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. This emphasis on practice comes to us from Jesus, who, when he was inviting the would-be disciples into new life, he didn't give them something to believe, but something to do. Leave your nets and follow me. In John's gospel, it says, come and see where I live, which is a way of saying, come and see what I do, and you will know the heart of God. Or love the Lord your God with your heart and your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Christianity was known as the way for a long time before it was known as Christianity, because the followers of Jesus were known by what they did, the practices they did together. And so it's so great that in the last few decades, actually really almost 50 years slowly, um, Christianity has been having sort of a new reformation, a new awakening where Christians are remembering and learning about the practices that our ancestors employed to help them 
open up to God, align with God within them and in the world. And so we're exploring these ancient practices and how they may give us new life. And for me, it's a really important to, uh, to do this right now because similar to the ancient Hebrews, we are living in an incredibly tumultuous time. Nationally, environmentally, politically, many of us personally. Things that we had relied on are falling apart. And so we have this invitation to stop and listen and pay attention. We are at a threshold. And so today's practice that I'm gonna talk about is about honoring thresholds. And this practice in particular, as a spiritual practice, comes to us from the ancient, from the Celtic Christian tradition. And the Celts, the Celtic Christians, understood in their theological imagination, their threshold, so this is a belief. You'll hear beliefs woven all through this. Belief and practice come together. But in the Celtic theological imagination, they understood thresholds of, of time and of space as spiritually potent. Maybe you've heard them described as thin places, places where the line between the sacred and the secular, this world and the other world, us and God, the lines that we imagine there become very permeable, transparent, translucent, porous. The Celts said that there were particular times of day where we could really feel this to be true, so dawn and dusk, particular times of year, so the solstice, the harvest seasons, and particular places in landscapes, edge places, place they were island people, right? So the place where the water met the shore or the place where the mountain met the sky. And so for the Celts, they would go to those places or attend to those moments in time with deep intentionality to pause and bring an openness to experience the divine presence. From this ancient practice, current Christians bring a belief or understanding or a practice that we are at threshold moments all the time. They're happening within us and around us at every moment. All the time, something is ending and something new is beginning. Some of these thresholds we're very consciously aware of, and sometimes we plan and work really hard to have them come about. Highly anticipated. Graduation getting married, having a baby, retiring, even going on a trip. Some threshold moments, however, come on us unbidden, very unwanted, sudden and debilitating illness, loss of a beloved, end of a relationship, end of a job. And many, probably most, threshold moments we cross without even noticing that they are there. A moment in a relationship where we meet a familiar stuck place, a well-worn pattern of conflict or communication loop. And we respond how we usually respond without ever thinking about it. Or we don't really hear what the other person is saying because we're so familiar with what they always say when we get into this place in our communication. And so we do what we always do. We step over the threshold moment without even recognizing that there was a chance, a moment, where we could have made a different choice. For the ancients of our faith, every moment is a new moment. Every moment is a time when God is longing, luring us more and more into alignment with the fullest possibility for flourishing. But we can so easily miss it. And so this practice, like all practices, are designed to help us create new habits, to get into the habit of pausing and noticing. The practice itself, the practice of honoring thresholds, is relatively simple. There are three parts, pausing, releasing, and receiving. And we see these elements in these passages that we heard from uh, Jeremiah and the Gospels. Again, Jesus says, thus says the Lord, Jeremiah says, thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. 
where the good way lies and walk in it. Find rest for your souls. So the first thing when you come to a threshold is to pause, stand at the crossroads, at the threshold, and look. Stand for a minute and notice where you are. The pause is so important. Our world is so fast-paced with so much emphasis on achieving, acquiring, arriving. There's not many prizes given for simply standing and noticing. This was the practice of last week, right? To practice paying attention, to practice just attending to one thing for five minutes. A couple of you told me like, wow, five minutes is a really long time. <laughs> also, I just want to say that um, partly the reason why we don't pause is because threshold moments in our lives can be deeply uncomfortable. Because by definition, when we are leaving, a threshold is when we are leaving one thing and going into another, the new thing hasn't begun yet. And so at those moments, there's likely to be grief, apprehension, anxiety, fear, even as there might also be excitement or relief. And feeling those feelings can be uncomfortable, especially often, almost always, we don't know exactly what is going to happen. And the not knowing, we it, humans, not so good with not knowing. We have to practice being open to the not knowing. We do not know how something is going to resolve. And so we consciously or unconsciously rush through the threshold. But this is the exact wisdom of our tradition that says that at this moment, when we don't know what is going to happen, is so full of the presence of God. If we pause and ask, ask for the ancient ways. Where does the good way lie? So the practice of thresholds is to pause and ask, what is this moment about, God? What is this moment offering me? John O'Donohue, the great late poet and mystic, writes about thresholds, and he says that we should ask ourselves regularly, what is the threshold on which I'm standing at this time in my life? What am I leaving? Where am I about to enter? What am I being invited to release in order to be free to receive? And so releasing is the second movement in this practice of honoring thresholds. Jesus told the would-be disciples that they needed to leave their nets and follow him. He was constantly saying, leave the old to begin the new. Turn around. Something needs to die in order for the new thing to be born. This invitation to release is crucial work of the threshold practice. Are we willing to let go of our old ways, our old behaviors, familiar habits, conditional reactions, our old beliefs that no longer serve us or the communities in which we live? Are we willing to let them go so that we can make space for the new thing that God is longing to do? Maybe you have heard the saying, wherever you go, there you are. Attributed to lots of different spiritual teachers, but essentially it points to this tendency that we humans have to bring our old stuff, our old baggage, with us into new situations. Our situation may have changed, new relationship, new job, new circumstances, but we find ourselves still experiencing the same types of difficulties, the same conflicts, the same stuck places we did before. And that's because while change is inevitable. Transformation is not. Transformation is optional. We get to choose whether we are willing to be open to the work of transformation that is happening within us and in our world. Or a better way maybe of saying that is we get to choose whether to participate with the transforming power and presence of God that is at work in the world and in us. And so the wisdom of our ancient practice of honoring the thresholds is a way to bring some conscious 
awareness of how to do that, to interrupt our habitual way long enough to notice our patterns, maybe even notice what we're bringing with us into the new situation, to ask for and receive guidance and make a choice to move forward in a new way. And so the third and final movement in this practice of thresholds is to receive, to open ourselves to whatever the new thing is that God is doing in and through us, even as we likely have no idea what that is. So the practice of honoring thresholds is three moments. Pause, release, receive. So there's a couple ways I invite you to do this practice this week. The first is think about your house and all of the times where you move literally from one threshold to another as you move from room to room, right? The threshold between your kitchen into your dining room or your living room, from your bathroom into your bedroom, from the front door into your house, every time you move from one room to another. And so choose a day, or maybe a part of a day, because this is a challenging practice, which I'll get to in a second. Choose a day and intend to consciously do this practice. When you come to the threshold, pause, release, and receive. Really spend some time doing this. So first the pause. Come, come into the threshold, stand, and take some breaths. And then release. And for me, it's helpful to have a gesture to remind myself what I'm doing. And so this comes from Cynthia Brugeau, this teaching is a great mystical contemplative teacher. She talks about how our hands help our brains and our hearts understand what we're doing. So you pause and then release. Literally let your hands open. As you bring some kind of consciousness or even a prayer, if you don't know, help me release what is getting in the way of receiving you, God. Help me release what is helping, keeping me from being aligned with the source of life. And then receive. Turn your hands up and say a prayer to receive whatever is to come. The second idea for practicing this practice, you could either do this or maybe do them both, is one, at least once this week, go to an edge place outside. For those of us on the island, we are so blessed because like the ancient Celtics, we have um, this beautiful, um, sacred edge place available to us all the time. So go to the lake shore. For those of you who are not on the island, find some edge place where you are, the edge of your street, Maybe if you do have a park, the edge of a park, and do the same practice again. Maybe spending a little bit more time, pausing to be really present and ask, at which threshold am I standing in my life right now? What threshold in my life do I want to be honoring? What am I leaving? Then release. What is preventing me from crossing? into this threshold, from really moving from what has ended to what is beginning. Sometimes we're in the new thing and we're still holding on to the old, right? And so it's hard for us to open up to the new. And then to receive, simply wait. There's a couple things I want to say about that. Spiritual practice is about the practice, not about the result. So sometimes, you may have this very luminous, spacious, grounding, open, um, grace-filled experience. And sometimes there's nothing. Which doesn't mean, this is a belief that I hold, it doesn't mean that God is not at work. We do the practice to train ourselves to do the practice when it matters. The other thing I want to tell you is what happened for me when I did this this week. And the reason I share this, this true confession, is just to dispel any myths that because I wear this robe, I'm somehow super spiritual or have more access to the divine presence than anyone else. So a couple things. I decided, um, I realized 
when I was thinking, I was like, okay, I need to, this is the practice we're doing. And so I always, I'm trying to do it a little bit the week ahead of when I invite y'all to do it. I noticed how much I think about doing the practice versus actually doing the practice. <laughs> I imagine myself doing it and two things happen. One, I think, oh yeah, 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 I get it. I get how it's supposed to work. And I can somehow tell myself that I've already done it. <laughs> and the other thing is I think, oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do it, but I don't intentionally figure out when I'm gonna do it and the day goes by and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. And then day goes by, day goes by, day goes by. So I offer that to you in case, I'm sure that never happens to any of you. <laughs> but I needed, once I realized and set intention and actually did it, did the threshold practice in my house, I noticed a couple other things. One, I was annoyed. I was annoyed and impatient because I really wanted to get from my office into the kitchen to make myself a cup of tea in the 10 minutes I had before my next meeting started. And to stop and do the practice interrupted that flow, which made me aware of how I am going through thresholds of my day all the time with complete lack of awareness of where I actually am, which is the point, right? The other thing I noticed is how often I came to that threshold and noticed I was holding my breath. So I don't know if this happens to you, but the other thing that happened to me was I noticed like how I I'm not deeply breathing through my day. So even that shift aligned me more with the sacred presence. And I also noticed again how my thoughts are so often anywhere other than where I actually am. And the one thing that's true about God is God is in the presence. And so if we want to experience the divine sacred, we open up to where the divine sacred is, which is right in this present moment. And so my intentional pause did indeed reground me. And at the end of the day, I did experience more spaciousness, more energy, more clarity, more joy, really, and more choice. Choice to be more loving, more patient with myself and with the beloved I live with, <laughs> more free, more aligned with that presence that I call God. So I invite you into that practice this week to choose some intentional noticing of thresholds inside your house or outside or both and see what happens. And I offer you this blessing that comes from Jan Richardson. It's called Blessing the Threshold. May you abide in the places in between, the thresholds, the passages, the spaces of waiting, and patience and preparing. May you give yourself to the mysteries that move us from what was toward what is yet to be. May you know the company of angels who come only to those betwixt and who love the liminal places for the treasures they hold. In the beginnings, in the endings, in the beginnings again, may the God of the threshold encompass you at every turn. Amen.
There we go. As we come to our moment of prayer, I'm going to invite us into some silence and um, invite you to speak your prayers out of that silence. And if it's just silent, that is okay. That God's, Thomas Merton says that God's first language is silence. Before we, um, you might want to call to mind places in, for yourself or in our world or people that you love who are at threshold moments um, and bring those to mind and to heart and hold them with special tender care. And I want to um, raise one in particular that Mark passed, let me know that his nephew Michael passed away earlier this week. And so we're holding Mark and Sue and Dan and Madeline and of course Michael's parents, Fred and Angie and Michael's sister Jessica in our hearts at this threshold moment, very painful for God's presence and peace and healing to be with that family. I invite all of us to be in a spirit of prayer. Like I said, I'll invite some silence. You're welcome to say your prayer. And at the end, I'll invite us to bring our voices together in the Lord's Prayer with whatever version of that prayer has resonance in your heart. Let us be in prayer together. God, thank you for your presence here with us and around us, luring us towards new life. God, hear the prayers of our hearts, the ones spoken, the ones silent, and the ones known only to you. Be with us in this time of prayer. God, we pray for all of those with COVID right now and all of those who are sick, that you would bring healing, presence, strength, recovery. God, we pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia, all the places in the world where there are violence here, that you would bring peace. Thank you for all the blessings of this life, this community, the lake, the birds, friends who are family, and the new life that you are offering to us always. God, we bring these prayers and the prayers of our hearts, binding them together in the words that Jesus taught his friends to pray. Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As always, we're so grateful for all of the ways that your generosity sustains and grows the life and ministry of this church. For those of you, thank you, Mark. For those of you who are participating online, um, just a reminder, you can give online, stjohnsmadelineisland.org. There's a give button right there on the right. For those of you who are here in person, thank you for your gifts in all of the ways that they come, in finances, in time, in talent, in prayers. We're so grateful. told um, Sherry not to play the doxology because it's impossible for us not to stand up and sing when we hear that. So we praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above, ye heavenly host, creator Christ and Holy Ghost. Amen. So Sherry will play our closing hymn, and again, I invite you not to sing, but if you want to hum slow, you know, softly behind your mask, you're welcome to. Uh, just a reminder that we will have fellowship outside, thanks to Deb and to Kay, so I invite you to join us and participate in that. Please um, receive the spirit and love of God in this closing hymn. <laughs> In the liminal places, in the beginnings, in the endings, in the beginnings again, may the God of the threshold hold you at every turn. And may the love of God, the peace of Christ, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you today and always. Amen. <laughs> 